Let us pray. Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the light of this new day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb. Open our hearts to believe the good news through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name.
said it at the first service, but I'm going to have to say it again. Can we just take a minute and acknowledge and savor that Easter joy that we just experienced? Thank you so much. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord. I have to tell you that writing an Easter sermon is a wonderful opportunity, and yet it's a challenge, especially if you've been at one church for now 20, 21 years. And as I was trying to figure out what to start with, I was intrigued by an interview I heard with Kevin Ollie, who's the head basketball coach at the University of Connecticut. Now, Kevin Ollie is an interesting story because he also played there. And part of the interview, he was remembering what it was like when he was a player before his 12 years in the NBA and playing with some of the greats who were still playing and then coming back and having to face the young players in his charge. He remembered sitting and listening to Coach Jim Calhoun telling the same story again and again. And Kevin Ollie said, I remember sitting there thinking, oh man, not this story again. I've heard this one. Can he find something new? Well, then the interviewer asked him the right series of questions, and Kevin Ollie said, you know what's funny? Here I am, now I'm the head basketball coach, and I sneak in the stories that are kind of fresh when I can. But some of those things that coach taught me are just the right things to say. And so I can see it in their faces. Oh man, not that story again. Well, that caught my imagination because I mean, it's Easter, you've heard the story. You already know it. Not that story again. And I caught myself ready to start this sermon with an image that I've used before. You know, the the experience that we've all had. You walk into a room, and you walk in with a head of steam. It, it indicates you had a purpose. But there you are in the room, and you can't remember why you're there. You're not laughing enough. Must, have, must be you don't, <laughs> you don't have this experience. I'm the only one. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you go back until you can remember what in the world you went into that room to do. Well, I think the women at the empty tomb have a similar experience. They've gone with a purpose, but their purpose, they're distracted. The stone is rolled away, the body is missing. But then these two guys, dazzling white apparel, angels, they say, don't you remember? And they remind them, they give them the ability to go back and start fresh and come into life anew. 
Then they remembered. On Easter Sunday, it seems to me there are three things for us to remember as we gather to yet again proclaim the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First is to remember to take the news of the resurrection seriously, to the point of taking it literally. I mean, this is the first aspect of the gospel today. The story is quite specifically and literally told. The stone was rolled away. They did not find the body. The Bible emphasizes these specific details. It was very real. And with help from the angels who were just as real as the event, they came to grips with what had happened. And to emphasize that part of Easter, I'm gonna share with you a poem a poem that John Updike wrote in 1960 called Seven Stanzas at Easter. And as you listen to this poem, I'd like you to notice that Updike, right at the beginning, draws a line in the sand. This is the whole of our faith. The whole of the New Testament, the whole gospel depends on us believing this. And then Updike, you'll notice, uses language of science. He describes what happened then as we would describe it today if we send an investigative team out to explain what happened. Even the angels, he describes, are vividly real, emitting subatomic particles, shedding their mass to the benefit of other things in God's creation. In other words, us. So hear this poem, seven stanzas, at Easter. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fail. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent, it was not as his spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the 11 apostles, it was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of enduring might new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping transcendence, making the event a parable, a thing painted in faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back. Not paper mache, not stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. And if we will have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque in the dawn light, robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. Let us not make it less monstrous, for in our own convenience, our own sense of beauty, lest awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by remonstrance. John Updike wrote that when he was in college. He wrote it because the church he was going to had a little arts fair, and he won first prize for his poem. He got 100 bucks. <laughs> he gave the church the money back, but the poem lives on. Daily Beast writer Matthew Sittman suggests that this Sunday, many churchgoers who have never read a page of Rabbit Run will nod along with Updike's verse. Seven Stanzas at Easter by Updike. But that only covers the first of three remembrances that I would encourage you, us, to embrace at Easter. The second is awe and wonder. No biblical passage tries to explain the resurrection or describe it even, or certainly not prove it. The literary device employed in each gospel story is to watch the story reflected in those who were witnesses, which begs the question, how does that include us? I doubt that anyone present today, except for the very young, is hearing the story for the first time. We came back. 
Why? What impact does this have on our lives, on our world, for our time and for what lies ahead? How does it change everything? The enormity of the grace of God in Jesus Christ is visible in no other story as powerfully as it is in the resurrection. And yet, God just puts it out there, inviting our belief, inviting our reflection and prayerful witness that truly this is the presence of God as clearly stated as it could possibly be. What a powerful experience this was for those who were the first witnesses. It must be similarly powerful for us. And finally, in both of the passages we read today, there is going and telling. The women go and tell the disciples and all the rest, it says. And in the Acts passage, Peter proclaims, he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Well, we can begin preaching about that living and the dead when we come to the Apostles' Creed in just a moment. But go out into the world and share this news, remembering that it happened. Remembering not only the fact, but the power of the truth. And remembering that God sent us all from the empty tomb to tell everyone we meet. May the Lord bless you as you go. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your presence touching our very lives with the good news of the resurrection gives us hope, strengthens our faith, and instills us with love that must be shared. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.